COVID-19 is beginning to have an impact on Uganda's economy. This evening, the Minister of Finance is saying more than 3.4 million Ugandans will be pushed into poverty. Out of these, 780,000 will be poorer in the next four months from now. This is due to the severe effects of the virus on tourism, a decline in imports and exports, slow down in workers' remittance and foreign direct investments, among others. As the global death and contraction of the disease increase, how best can Uganda handle the health, social and economic implication of the pandemic? Tonight we host Dr. Richard Kavanda, Commissioner Health Promotions, Minister of Health, Dr. Richard Idro, President of Uganda Medical Association, and Mr. Ramadan Gobi, an economist. Gentlemen, thank you very much for having responded to our invitation. I must tell you tonight that the spotlight is on you for Uganda, and so everybody is waiting to listen from your expertise and your experiences on how we can handle coronavirus or COVID-19. I want to begin with you, President of Uganda Medical Association, just to bring us to speed on where we stand now as far as the virus attack is concerned. Good evening viewers. Um, uh, Patrick, thank you for inviting Uganda Medical Association to be part of this uh, discussion. Um, as we are all aware, um, the coronavirus 19 is a new strain of uh, viral illness of the corona group of viruses, many of which have been around for a long time, including those causing the the usual flu which, uh, which, which we have first appeared in China but has rapidly spread around the world and uh, on all continents and as of today nearly 240,000 cases of um, pe uh, thousand uh, people have been infected and over 9,000 uh, 9, deaths have, uh, have occurred. Um, the disease is also, has also come to the African continent and uh, several countries are affected, um, uh, including almost all our neighbors in uh, Kenya, in Tanzania, in uh, Rwanda, and uh, DR Congo. Uh, so far, uh, as Uganda, we are an island. Um, we have not had a single um, disease. Um, and we continue to monitor our borders, and it is our prayer so and really part of the account, hard work. Is that on the account of our vigilance, the vigilance of the ministry and the people, the practici health practitioners, or is it just by sheer luck or grace of God? We don't have this thing in our, on our doorstep. Um, Patrick, I, um, the Ministry of Health in Uganda has distinguished itself in uh, control of epidemics. Um, in, in this region, in the Great Lakes region, we have had uh, quite a number of ep epidemics over the past few years. And uh, one of the most recent has been the Ebola epidemic, which has killed thousands of people in <coughs> DR Congo. And uh, we managed to, to keep our borders almost completely safe. And uh, since the onset of this, uh, this particular epidemic, the Ministry of Health has really worked uh, quite hard. And um, uh, health workers have been active at all the border points. And our, our belief it is, is that it has been this action which has kept this virus out of this country. Today. Dr. Kabanda, you are a commissioner, health promotion, the Minister of Health. And he's just talking about uh, the border points. Uganda has porous borders. I can imagine you have put your people at known border points, Luakaka, maybe you're in Busia, maybe in, in Elegu, maybe in uh, Minama Hills or, or Chanika or other places. But Ugandans are not going, all of them, to go through those border points. They can pass anywhere. So what is your plan even to target those? Yes, Patrick, thank you for inviting the Minister of Health to be part of this, uh, this show. Let me start by um, greeting our viewers. Uh, good evening. And um, for those, always we say that for those who may be known too well, uh, our, our part as health workers is to, is to provide a service and God heals. 
So as uh, my namesake has said, there's quite a lot that the Minister of Health has done. And our strength in, within the region, but also within the country, is much more in surveillance and in public health risk communication. Because for prevention of any disease, those, those are the first two uh, major key areas. And then supplemented by coordination. So we know you, you, you are very much aware that we have quite a number of uh, surveillance officers who have been made within the different uh, border posts. But also, we, we, we work so much with the communities, and uh, our community engagement strategies is what worked for us within, uh, for the border preparedness within Kasese and the nearby districts. So we believe that, uh, we believe as the health sector that we cannot be able to do much. When it comes to prevention of diseases, as the health sector, we contribute like 30 or 35 percent. And then other stakeholders uh, do their part. So when it comes to community engagement and uh, involving communities to be able to, to man, uh, to discuss issues related to surveillance, uh, then communities do, do, do their best. That's why uh, for us we feel proud when there are so many cases, false cases being reported. Then we get to know that communities actually are aware and they are alert. So without those cases being reported, then we, get, we, are, we, always, we always get worried. We not get those cases. So our, our strength is in working with the communities, in community engagement, is in surveillance, but also within public health risk communication. That has been our strength. And uh, as Richard has said, if you, look at, if you look at the measures put in place by, by the Minister of Health or by the government of Uganda so far, or within the region, we are the first actually country within the region to say that uh, these countries, we are going in for self-quarantine. And our neighbors had not gone that far. In fact, you stopped some risk, high-risk countries coming to Uganda before yes. even America pronounced yes. the Europeans not to go to the United States. Yes. Yes. Some days before that. Yes. So we believe that for us, our strength is in taking quick decisions. Because for preparedness, the more you take long to take a decision, the more you suffer. And that's why some countries are now suffering, because they, t they really took long to take, take that decision. So we, we moved a step, a step uh, and we decided that some countries, if you come to Uganda, then you're going to self quarantine. And that gave us some mileage. And also uh, the essence of, of uh, stopping people from entering Uganda from all the border posts was our strength for, for, for prevention of this disease for, for let now. Me, let me come to you, Mr. Ramadan Gobi. I know you're an economist, but as a Ugandan, I just want to know, to pick your, your brain on how we have moved in terms of behavioral change. Are Ugandans so alert? Are, are we a little bit unique in terms of responding to diseases because we've been battered by Ebola, we've been battered by Marburg and all these kind of things, and have those uh, uh, misfortunes maybe given us some kind of uh, backbone of steel to stand and face when we get such a problem? Thank you. Um, I'm not an expert of behavioral kind of aspect, but what I know about us Ugandans, we are quite noisy and nosy. Unlike many uh, people in our neighborhood, neighborhood mm -hmm. Ugandans are quite very noisy in you know, everything. If you look around, actually, you may think Uganda is the worst place on the planet. The way we talk about uh, the health system, how it is so much broken down and, uh, and yet we are no longer dying the way we used to die. Life expectancy has increased. A lot of the health indicators, they're actually the opposite of what we say. Mm. But this is good for the population to be, you know, really out there. Asking a lot better, of pressure. Because they deserve better. these guys. Mm -hmm. So that um, they can improve. And I think this partly helps us. But also, um, I think even God, God has been on our side. I think you need to read a book. That. You need to read a book that has just been... Uh, published by yes. Dr. Oliver Kovsinje mm -hmm. called The Patient. Mm -hmm. In fact, he says in that book, uh, you know, you could be a patient, but you are, you are admitted in a, in, a, in a health system which is also sick. I, I think you should get that book. So maybe yeah. you may have to change your, some of your views. She's a medical doctor who's worked around Uganda, yeah. and uh, she has practiced medicine, yeah. but also she has written what she's been able to see. Yeah. The Patient is the book you should read. That's, okay. what I, that's what I was saying, that, and it, I don't need to read her book. Um, so many people, including myself, we, make, we are quite tough on, on the systems here uh, when it comes to, 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 to actually evaluating them, the, the health system, the education system, the, the, the economy itself, and so on. And to me, that is good. So you are, you are saying the criticism we have put on our uh, on the government and MDAs yeah. is also breeding quality. Oh yeah, uh, okay, because they have to respond. Okay, so I want to get on the issue that is of uh, 
bothering Ugandans, especially when you announce that if you come from anywhere mm -hmm. to maybe high-risk countries or wherever, mm -hmm. and you reach Entebbe, you're going to self-quarantine. Mm -hmm. And I'm told whoever is <coughs> self-quarantined has to meet, to meet the cost. And I'm told it's $100 in, in a day. And, and that means maybe $1,400 for the 14 days. What in God's name were you thinking? Because we have, where, who gets $100 to sleep? You know that we have 150,000 Ugandans working odd jobs in the Middle East. In, not uh, even a hotel. Yes, and, and then why? Why did you? Is that the figure anyway? <coughs> yes, when we, when, we, when we took a decision, I think it was two weeks back, 14 days now, ever since the minister pronounced on, on giving different categories of countries and uh, giving guidance on which countries should actually, individuals should go in for self-quarantine. We have, we have been into this system for the previous 14 days. And uh, since Monday, we realized that self-quarantine is, is too expensive for government. It is not if even effective because uh, f when, when, when you self-quarantine, it means that... Self-isolate, uh, in other words. No, 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 there are two things. Self-quarantine self and self-isolation are different okay. things. So for when you talk about self-quarantine, you look at people who have been, who are at risk. So that maybe you, Patrick, you are from a country which, is, which has so many cases, and we suspect that you may be at risk. So we, we decide to put you uh, in one place, confine you in there, so that you are, not, you are not exposed to other people. So in any case, if you, if you, if you develop signs and symptoms of, say, for COVID, then other people will be safe. So it was expensive for us as government. And people were scattered all over the country. And it was not sustainable, it was not even effective. So we took a decision to go into institutional quarantine. Because with self-quarantine, it means that on a daily basis, our surveillance teams are supposed to come to you. And to monitor you. Monitor you. So it was too expensive for us. And also, we are not sure whether people are abiding to the rules of the what? Of government. So it was difficult for us, for, 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 for the security teams, for health workers, to be able to say that Patrick has been confined this place and he's there all the time. So it was safer for us, cheaper for government, but also, it is more effective to go into institutional quarantine. With institutional quarantine, you confine people in one, in, in, in one institution. It may be a hotel, it may be a school, it may be any other gazetted place. So from, from Monday night up, up to now, so we are now still following institutional quarantine. And uh, from that time when the decision was taken, you remember when the, when the minister pronounced, it was very clear that whoever comes to Uganda, you'll self-quarantine, but... You'll, you'll be able to meet costs yeah, you, yeah, because as an individual. I know, and I have a lot of respect for, the, for, for Honorable Jenna Cheng, mm. Dr. Cheng. Mm. But that statement that, you know, she said it with a lot of uh, casually, that you will meet your own cost and, and you have no option. <laughs> and, and for even sake, we're talking about $100 for these Ugandans coming from all over the places. Some of them, VIPs, can manage. But a typical Ugandan, that is too much to ask. Uh, it, uh, it, has, it has sparked a lot of debate, debate even on social media because... The available hotel by Monday was charging individuals 100 US dollars to take care of accommodation and meals all through. But we are in Tebe all, uh, the whole of yesterday to look out for other hotels who have been in touch with the Minister of Tourism, Minister of Tourism, to ensure that we are able to identify hotels that can actually be able to provide but, but or give must, services must, okay, must to slightly be a lower. Hotel. Because you, you have said an option of maybe a school, and then you can put there some, some you know, bedding materials mm -hmm. now that the schools are what? Are closing? Why don't you, you think about you're, that? You're talking in the future tense. But on Monday, <laughs> on Monday the situation was, dif it was different from the, that time when we, when we took a decision. So from, 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 from tomorrow, that's Friday, it will be a different issue. But we thought about the issue of the school, identifying a government school within the Entebbe, Entebbe area, so that we are able to have, but the decision had not been taken by government. So when the president made a pronouncement yesterday, so it, it is now easier for us to be able to have discussions all over about this issue. Dr. Idro, your take on self-quarantine? The initial stages where um, an individual will go and self-quarantine was fairly difficult to monitor and uh, really also had um, several, uh, we had several concerns partly as, uh, as health workers. Um, uh, take a situation that somebody came from from Entebbe, crossed that city, and um, went to Nebi, for example. Went to Nebi, <laughs> has not been seen by the villagers, the relatives, for the past six months. There is almost a party 
that the villagers are going to come. People have chicken to kill, to, uh, to come and, they and be with these. Him. They are jumping all over him. And then when you reach Nebi, it is a hut. In fact, some Ugandans even picking somebody at the airport is a big party. Yes, yeah. there's a big party. People may come with a minibus to collect you. You have been away for several years. And then you go to Nebi, there's a hut. The bathroom is outside. The toilets are outside. You have to move. So really, the inst uh, institutionalized quarantine had to come. Okay. Well, what's the difference between self-quarantine and self-isolation? Now, as I said earlier on, for self-quarantine or institutional quarantine, it happens when you know that uh, either Richard or Richard or Patrick doesn't have any signs and symptoms. So you just suspect that he's from a high-risk area mm -hmm. or country or he has been close to a person who has been diagnosed with COVID. So you take a step and say, let us not risk to expose those who are around Patrick mm -hmm. and the entire community. If in, in any case, if Patrick got the disease, chances are high that these other people will actually be able to, to, get, to, to get the disease. So you decide to take that, that step of say, let us put you aside for 14 days and monitor. Because you assume that by within 14 days, if you actually got the disease, chances are high that you will have man manifested. So what happens for isolation is that we actually know that um, um, this person has developed uh, signs and symptoms which, which are close or similar to COVID. So you are not sure that this person actually has the word. And the, the difference is that for, 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 for self-isolation, it doesn't happen in hotels or in, in isolation or in your homes. It happens in designated health facilities, like in Tebe, like in Agul, which ones, which, which we are able to, 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 to identify for now. So with, with the intention that uh, if it is Richard or hospital. Patrick, in, in the hospital, hospital. In yes. hospital. Mm. so the, the, the medical team should be able to, to do the assessment and provide the treatment if it is required for any, any kind of uh, anomaly so that we are able to, to know that uh, Patrick or Richard will be able to be better within this specific period of time. And it is those institutions where the uh, samples will be taken yes. and because this is a suspected case and the samples sent for testing. Tomorrow, schools and institutions are closing. You are a teacher, in fact, a lecturer at Macquarie University Business School. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that going likely to affect the academic year for the institutions, for example, like the ones where you teach? It's all turned upside down. Um, we have to rethink on how we are going to catch up and uh, make up this time. And yet we are not sure that actually there will be those days because they might extend it. In other countries, they started like that. And uh, have kept on extending, they yes. have now extended even the Premier League and so on. So um, it was actually a big blow to, to our arrangements, to our uh, kind of organization. But we understood it for the good of the nation for the health of those people we are teaching because we are always a crowded kind of um, a community in the universities. Like MOOBS has over 17,000 students. Okay, they are not there at the same time. Uh, it's, you know, universities behave like as if they are airports, as some are checking in, uh, others are out. checking out. But still they are very big numbers to be in such a concentrated place. And interestingly, actually, something even which I tweeted. You know, um, I was at university when the president was making the statement. And that very moment he announced, the entire university went wild. Students were jubilating <laughs> that they are going Wait home. Wait a minute. Jubilating? <laughs> oh, yeah. They were Happy going for first leave. They were celebrating, I think, getting a holiday of yeah. about 30 days because we were about to examine them the second mid-term exam, the, the, the coursework, uh, which um, uh, precedes the exam, the final exam. And uh, I want to assure them that uh, we are waiting for a month and they will come back and still it will be the and, program and running. And but they were, they were really tougher because happy. sometimes it, it, it when you're going to some kind of a slumber, when you come back it, and get an exam. It kind of yeah. shocked me, but I remembered that anyway. That, that's how students you're one student behave. One. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you, yeah, but okay, uh, can our health care system, God forbid, if cor coronavirus eventually hits Uganda, in, in the most likely event that will, do we have the capacity to handle? I understand there's one area where we can test 
the, the virus from, and that's in Entebbe. And I'm thinking somebody's in Kihihi, somebody's in Chawente, somebody's in Kabagarame, and they get a disease. The only it's place where you, can be, where you can be able to, 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 to test is in Tebe. And if you get numbers, thousands and more, are we not likely to face a real problem? When, when, when you talk about capacity, you're looking at it in terms of, uh, terms of human resource, the technical human resource, yes. in terms of supplies, drugs and medicines, in terms of infrastructure, okay? Yes, you're so actually making it even more complicated. Yes, you're, but oh. capacity is, you're looking at it comprehensively. Yes. Do you have capacity to do ABCD? Do you have capacity to do ABCD? If actually, they, if you look at um, the approach taken by government, is in that direction. That in any case, if you are being hit hard like the way it is now, it will be difficult for government to, take, uh, to be able to provide uh, adequate services to Ugandans. So that's why it's better for us to take, uh, uh, preventive. to go preventive. And uh, we hope that uh, the approach taken, because if you talk about the, the approach, the, the preventive ap approach takes into consideration the, the public health policies, uh, guidelines, and directives. And when the, the, when the president pronounces himself on those, it's from an informed public health point of view that we don't have the capacity if you have, for example, if you are hit and you have 500 people who have tested positive and they need, say, ICU care, can government be able to take Take, 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 take this on. Actually, even when you have the resources, people who are dying in Italy, it's not that they are poor. They do have the money. But if you find out that even when you have actually personal resources as, as Patrick, if infrastructure is not well put, you may not be able actually to access the There's something called a ventilator mm. that is crucial but, uh, in the treatment of a disease like this. And perhaps yes. you'll, you'll be able to answer this as you mm. say something that you want to say. And, and I'm told uh, a, a ventilator, even the United States is struggling. Uh, do we even have, in those ICUs, do we have those ventilators, a machine that can help you to breathe in case you get breathing difficulties, Dr. Idro? Okay, so let, let me first start with the testing, um, the, uh, the question about testing. Um, one, of the, one of the ways through which systems developed is um, a centralized system, a uh, testing system, um, where you work through, um, these are, some of these things are from the business mo uh, models, where you have big, uh, big numbers and you develop quality systems through which things, uh, things work. And uh, over the years, uh, the country has, has actually improved this, and we have the Central Public Health Laboratories, yes. which is doing HIV testing for the over 1.3 million babies who are born in this country every um, every year, so the samples are collected from all over the yes. all over the country, and they are coming here. We are using the same system. You know, the thing is, yeah. HIV can give you time. N no, it's not going to take you down in fourteen days. No, even, um, for, Corona, COVID, even for COVID, when it comes to diagnostic, what, yeah. what Richard mm -hmm. is trying mm -hmm. to the point mm -hmm. we're trying to raise, mm -hmm. when it comes to diagnostic, we may be able to to, to do much because we have built the systems. The there, system there. is working. Yes. So once um, a case is, re uh, is, is reported, is report, reported let's say a suspect, more. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, you see, we have the national task force, and then at each each district, there's the district uh, task, task force. force which which works, and then there are the surveillance units yes. who are un under him, and there are the lab people. So there's a call which goes um, that there's a a, pot uh, a potential case in in Lamo, and they go to this place, take the samples, and the samples are brought to Entebbe. Now within Entebbe, it takes four hours. We are doing. Uh, and it's one of to the best. Test, to test one, you know, take one sample, four hours to get the results. With, within. Within Entebbe. Within Entebbe. So it is only the distance to cover it from. And, 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 and can any other ordinary person take the sample mm. from someone? No. So it is specific people who have been wait trained. A, wait a minute. Yeah. So if you get a case in Cotido today, you have to send a specific group of people. No, there are people. There are, there are people who are trained in yeah, each of the regions under the di uh, the different surveillance systems. So let's then let, let me come to the the care systems. Uh, our first step has been prevention yes. that it does not reach this country, and uh, we are doing as uh, the Ministry of Health and the different health workers are really doing everything possible that it doesn't reach. And soon it reach, now we are developing a kind of um, a system which can then care for the, the, uh, the potential um, cases. So we have regional uh, referral hospitals um, around the country 
and uh, each of these is going to be a site where we can conduct triage, mm -hmm. where we can isolate, and where we can care for the very sick okay, in let me, ICU. All right, let me go to you, to, uh, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, because I see the world has moved so fast in trying to contain coronavirus, yet coronavirus is not as, is not as lethal as other diseases that have uh, been problematic to us, especially Ebola. I'm told it kills almost 67% of its victims, yet coronavirus is between 3% four or even 2 And uh, have other diseases been neglected because they are afflicting the poor? A wonderful question to an economist. But um, I think uh, it's not uh, that other diseases have been neglected. I think coronavirus uh, virus is quite unique in a way that I, I haven't seen a viral disease going around the world at the speed at which this disease has gone around the world. We have been it's over the years being checked in Ebola, what on airports and so on. But you haven't had a lot of cases multiplying, you know, to different places within no time. And because we, we started around in December mm -hmm. in China, and within no time you had, now it is in Italy, now it is in the UK, now it is in the US, and it is hitting the big guys in the world. It has finished all the G8, the group of eight. These are the <coughs> richest countries. And... Um, there is no immediate, you know, m medicine for it, vaccine and so on. And um, then at the same time, you find that uh, it has this impact now on globalization because <laughs> the world has become so globalized. But now we are shutting down the world. I haven't seen a disease. But if you looked at uh, the kind of death that Ebola did in West Africa yeah. and maybe the kind of death that happened only in Congo, yeah. And, and if you maybe you get to know how many people are dying of tuberculosis today or even malaria or even HIV AIDS, the numbers are just astronomical. But yet this thing, as, as deadly as it may be, mm. is not comparable in my thinking in terms of mortality to those diseases. And I'm not seeing the kind of attention put on these kind of diseases that have been decimating the human population in many parts of, of the poor world. But uh, Dr. Idro... Dr. Rick Kabanda and Mr. Ramadan Gobi. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Kamara. My guests tonight are Mr. Ramadan Gobi, who's an economist, Dr. Richard Idro, and Dr. Richard Kabanda. But now we want to go to Entebbe and uh, get to, we shall be getting to Entebbe much later. I suppose we want to get to connect with the Permanent Secretary Minister of Health, Dr. Diana Atwine, so that she can bring us to speed on what is happening on the institutional quarantine. Uh, my, my colleagues are in the control room are trying to work the phone so that we can have Dr. Diana Atwine online. But before we can get there, maybe uh, Dr. Idro, do we have capacity okay you, you've talked about capacity but but moving forward are we likely to see you know the behavior change because this thing the little i'm getting from you experts is more about hygiene really washing your hands and using sanitizers and all these kind of things how do we ensure that washing hands and hygiene becomes the norm because if we did that as a country then we would cut so much of the preventable diseases? Ab absolutely. Maybe that is one of the good things. Um, the, corona uh, uh, the, the coronavirus 19 is doing the to, to this country. Um, just by the simple hand wash for 20 seconds with soap and water several times a day in between all different kinds of contact may will help us to prevent it but not only this but several other germs and uh, this kind of behavior um, change which which we are starting to see mm -hmm. we really believe is going to to help cut many other diseases uh, the diarrheal diseases especially but also the respiratory 
or, or the diseases which infor, uh, involve the breathing system. Well, I think many of them are going to, to, to go down. Diseases of hygiene, uh, the worms which we have in our community, very many of them, skin diseases, lots and lots of them will, will be able to go down. And particularly if this behavior eventually gets, um, gets, gets sustained. And uh, the more we do it, maybe even if eventually it comes in the country, hopefully, will be able to limit its spread uh, much better than if these actions had not been instituted earlier. It takes quite a while to, to, to adapt to these behaviors. For example, not touching the faces is a very difficult thing. Um, f after, f <laughs> within five minutes, you may find that you have yes, actually the, moved the, your touch your face. The head of state, this country said he cannot even s uh, scratch himself using the right hand. Mm. He only does it with his <laughs> left. And I'm told he cannot also not clap because mm. he doesn't want his right hand to infect, infect the left one, which yes. he uses. So I think you've got to have some rare qualities. And he, has, certain, he has practiced for a very long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if there's anything that stood out for me, I mean, other things, is President Museveni talking about his characteristics and, 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 and behavior in terms of trying to keep safe, that he cannot even clap because he has he's been shaking people's hands, so he thinks the right will the right hand will infect the, le the left, which he uses to scratch himself. I'm and like, yeah. who does that? <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder why he has kept And calm. that he can... <laughs> 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 yeah, so if, when you put that kind of dedication and precision in, in trying to keep yourself that way, which is a good thing, where else are you putting the dedication mm -hmm. and how is it yeah. uh, doing? But let me get to understand we have a connection line to the Permanent Secretary Minister of Health. Dr. Diana Atwine, who is in Entebbe. Dr. Diana, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, we are happy to have you online. We're humbled you gave us your time. We'd want to know how is the institutional quarantine moving on? I understand you are at Entebbe Airport or thereabout. Yes, um, I've been here with the minister since uh, the afternoon. Okay. Uh, we also received information that uh, some debts are having challenges of payment, others are refusing to be quarantined. So we came here, first of all, to hear what are their issues, and also to sort out there are some people who are writing and to make sure that every debt gets a appropriate place. I understand uh, the so ministry. We, I understand the ministry. I understand you are considering deploying the army because some of the people you are quarantined <laughs> are not accepting to be quarantined. Is that is that true? Absolutely, absolutely. Right now, I'm one of the hotels because uh, some people have refused to, to go in the room. Others uh, wanted to go and find their run out there. So. Now we are strengthening the deployment of security, but also talking to the hotel owners to observe what we have put in place to make sure our people who arrive at this, they are looked after, but at the same time also that they don't endanger the population. You say, you say that whoever is... Uh, being quarantined has to pay a hundred dollars a night. That money is quite on we, the high. We, we have been, uh, 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 we negotiated with uh, lower rates with uh, managers, and so we are, we are checking people according to what they can afford. The students, we are, we are going to consider identifying the school. Yes where we can put them and, uh, and, and they undergo for two weeks and then they can go to their home. Understand especially, quite, a, uh, understand quite a number of Ugandans, especially those working in the Middle East. Some of them, they were getting uh, tickets to come back to Uganda. And you know, we have almost 150,000 Ugandans working in the Middle East. What happens if they decided to come? It is true a number of Ugandans are coming back, not only from the Middle East, but from all over the Because of the, the current issues, most of them have been told to leave and to their countries. 
So we also have to take care of our own. But the only uh, feasible option so that people cannot afford to identify a place at least they can buy food, but they don't pay for accommodation. All right, Dr. Diana Atwine, Permanent Secretary, Minister, Minister of Health, we thank you very much for your time. And we know you as health workers, you are the frontline soldiers fighting this battle to, to defeat mm -hmm. coronavirus. We, are thank, we thank you so much and we are humbled what we are doing. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had Dr. Diana Atwine that now they've decided even to deploy the army. Yes, yes, yes. That was decided actually on Monday when we had a number of people, including some, some people from other countries who were, were actually resisting uh, to go to designated areas. But Patrick, I wanted to raise something about what you asked about on, uh, what you asked Richard on behavioral health science and its impact in disease prevention. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, within the ministry, I'm in charge of behavioral health science and, 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 and basically what, what we are discussing here is, is mainly in my docket. Yeah. And, and I, I feel comfortable if I'm able to share with the, with the Ugandans what we need to do and also the science about behavior, sustaining behavioral science. Uh, mainly when it comes to disease prevention and all these other related aspects, you and, uh, and him and many other academicians and the community, they look at the health workers. So they think that we, it is our duty to be able to contribute an entire 100% to, to, to disease prevention within the country, which is not actually possible. If you look at the different measures put in place to sustain, say, behavioral health related uh, aspects, you need to have uh, as many stakeholders as possible. You need the politicians on board, you need the religious leaders on board, you need the cultural institutions on board, because there are those cultural related uh, practices which actually spark off some of these diseases. You also need uh, the, 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 the local people to be involved in the drive, because most of the aspects that actually need to be enforced in our communities for us to be able to sustain, take an example of malaria, you talked about malaria in most of our countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa and many other countries. Look at malaria. If we are to able, if we are able to, to prevent it, it's, been, it's mainly behavioral. Say, sleep under mosquito net. As simple as that. People don't do it. Even when government uh, uh, moves a step to be able to provide uh, free mosquito nets. But I must say, but I must say, in yes. the last two, three years, actually, the minister has done so much to reduce the prevalence rates yes, of yes. malaria. Yes, yes. And, uh, and still, this, this very year, we are going to distribute uh, mosquito nets. Maybe people didn't have the nets before. Why are the numbers going down of Malay? Have they all of a sudden changed behavior? So there Sometimes been. the incentives are lacking for them to change behavior. But, but providing incentives is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. That's why if you look at the, the previous three, three, four, five, or six years within the Ministry of Health, but also moving forward within the, the entire health system structure, there has been uh, growth in the encouraging people to be able to, to behave in a more responsive manner. And, and that's, why, that's why I was saying that we need as many stakeholders as, as possible, including you. Because if whenever you come to a talk show, you're able to talk about something related to health, chances anyway, are high that people will be able uh, to respond. There's a saying that, that health is made at home, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, we know, for example, that the minister, this, he, he appeared before parliament and he was more, more or less reading from the book of lamentation. This is likely to happen, this is going to happen, and uh, poverty is going to increase, and probably we can lose this number of jobs. We have seen in, in the United States, they seem to be pro proposing something like a stimulus package or, or helping the uh, businesses uh, stay afloat mm -hmm. or something like that. And uh, many people got loans, uh, probably they are working into hotel industries, maybe event management and schools and stuff like that. And the loans, the banks are waiting for them to, to pay. So there are going to be a lot of non-performing loans. As an economist, how, what do you think should the government be doing right now mm. at least safeguard Uganda's economy? Yeah, first of all, um, COVID-19 is as economically contagious as it is medically. Although uh, a lot of response so far has been on the public health uh, kind of intervention is to ensure that it doesn't get here, it doesn't spread. Even if no Ugandan catches this disease or dies, a lot of people and businesses are going to go bankrupt and the economy get ruined because what is happening, uh, what are the interventions they are doing to ensure that we don't get this virus, uh, quarantining people, 
uh, encouraging us to ensure social distancing and so on. The economy needs the direct opposite of those things. We need to, you know, move around to make money, interact. and also we need to social interact and all that to get to face-to-face -face interactions. Right now, uh, when I was driving to come here, I've never seen Kampala the way it is now. Um, I, I've had a smooth ride from Nakawa up to here at around 8.30. Uh, usually, there's a lot of traffic on the road, but now people have gone home because, one, there are no bars, there are no these concerts and so on. They, are, they have all been stopped. So, so somebody is losing money right now? Right now, the economy has gone to bed. And when the economy goes to bed, the ramifications in terms of the multiplier effects which you are losing becomes now the biggest challenge. And this is where the global economy now is being hit so hard. That this virus is really wonderful that it came and hit at multiple sites, including the very nerves which supply the economic lifeliners. Life and um, when you come from the global now meltdown, which is happening, the figures have already come out. We have downgraded the growth projections from 2.9 now to 2%. And uh, to non-economists, those are just numbers. And uh, they are quite small. You say 2.9 to 2. Uh, what's the big nine. difference? It's only 0 0.9? Oh, it's massive. And uh, it's going to cascade into now, first of all, money is not going to move around the world. Already, the world has gone into a wait and see mode. Everybody who has money in the bank doesn't want to spend it, just in case uh, the, the worst scenarios happen. Even here in Uganda, it has already happened. I've seen people going to purchase things that they don't need, but they think they want them, and they are keeping them. Holding sort of? No. They are trying to, to stockpile okay. just in the event of, uh, say, a shortage or uh, the president coming on TV once again and say, now it's markets. They are not going to. Uh, so people start to go into those kind of uh, um, anticipations and they affect the economy badly. So capital flow is down. When you look at uh, where, the, where do Ugandans get money here? Most of the Ugandan businesses are now service-based. It contributes 48% of Uganda's GDP on the rebased GDP. And most of these services, they are informal services. They need face-to-face -face interactions. In Uganda, we haven't built this monetized economy, which is digital and so on. Now, the people are not there. And once you close, for example, a bar, like now they have been closed. That so guy who the factory. you have you have closed the factory indirectly. You have closed the guy Section who is of growing the barley. Uh -huh. You have closed the guy who is supplying raw material, and even the one who is working in that factory when he doesn't get a wage, he won't be able to buy chicken in this village. And even the one who produces chicken is somehow connected to the bar in, in such a way that uh, where there is a bar, there is one who's making uh, the chicken in Chomo and so on. So it, it's going to cascade into that kind of breakdown in the circular flow. There, there is that simple economics we usually teach students. I think, that there is, I think that's the reason why you even call money a currency, as if it is a current moving into... Yes, it keeps <laughs> on moving around. Yeah. And once the rest of money goes down, the economy is dead. So. Um, already the Minister of Finance has given some kind of semblance of what they think are uh, the projections under the current situation when we don't have the disease here, but just the contagion effects. But in the event the disease comes, and you know usually, crises, they are like taxis. Always one is coming. So... Um, Today it might be a crisis in terms of contagion that you can't 
uh, you know, when he catches cold and he gives it to me, I sneeze also. That's how also the economy works. When China caught the, the cold, the entire world is sneezing. Is sneezing, both medically yeah. and economically. Okay. Because China is the biggest supplier of our fast moving goods so that the we global use factory. every day. Yeah. No. They produce a quarter of the global. And the, it has been on a shutdown for quite a time, although now they are, the good news is that they are slowly reopening. But as they are reopening, the rest of the world is shutting down. And that's where Uganda now gets. So to even their reopening is not going to help the world because the world is closing. Yeah, the world so is we closing. So still, we still may not have much. But, from it, them. but it's still, that's a very good news to me because it means that. For countries like Uganda, which haven't yet been hit directly by the disease, you can still do business online with China, and you can even get better deals now because the demand is low, because the rest of the world is not open. That's why business people in Uganda have to be very careful. Those who are holding goods in anticipation of selling them uh, a few months later at a higher price, they might burn their fingers. Okay, that's the economic because, part of it, uh, yep. just a little bit of the economic part of it and the impact. But back to the, the human body, uh, Dr. Idro, who is most at risk? I understand, again, what I've listened from some people, that there could even, a, could even be a person who gets infected and even they never get to know that they have the disease and it clears and they move on. And I've been trying to listen as if children from zero to around nine seem to be more resistant, but this is what I'm picking, but you are the experts. Yes. Um, uh, Patrick, um, for any disease which your body does not know, something which, any germ which enters your body, which your body has never experienced, once it enters, your immune system tries and recognizes this, this, yes, this yes. germ as a foreign entity in the body then it produces antibodies against it. And once the anti meanwhile, the germ will be causing chaos in your body. Now, there are things which may uh, determine how much of this chaos it is able to cause in your body. If it finds you weak in terms of, say, with a uh, poor nutritional status, if it finds you weak in terms of uh, poor health from other conditions, um, uh, maybe because of age, maybe because you have another disease, maybe you have diabetes, things which have weakened you, the likelihood that your body may respond adequately to this disease is compromised. So where you have a fit young man without any additional problems, an athlete, very strong young man who is growing, this young man is more likely to be able to fight this disease much more than an elderly person who has multiple other has a heart problem maybe with diabetes maybe the knees are not right and as such um, when you look at how this disease has affected the different populations if your body fights it adequately it may actually control it before it even produces symptoms so you so remain. So there's a likelihood that some people can get it. You and get it. You get continue. infected, so, and so the symptoms may not show. Others so may get mild disease. So now we have a young population. Yes. yes. Majority of our people are young. They are eating organic food. They are living in rural Uganda. Mm. So there's a possibility. What you just said, that the disease could have passed, and uh, quite of some of them are not even feeling it. Um, <laughs> because the disease is coming from somewhere. Yes. It it did not originate here. Yeah. Uh, it did not originate here, that the systems at the border were there to try to detect this. That anybody who came with a this symptom... This is a disease, uh, Dr. Idro. That's yes. It. Me, myself, I started listening on the 31st of December 2019 to hear the cases in, yes. in Hubei province. Mm. Uh, and, and quite a number of Ugandans are in Wuhan. I mean, by then we had not put any mechanism. So I'm thinking, and we have a young population, maybe 80% or whatever, robust young Ugandans eating the healthy Chinese food. Chinese were coming Yeah, here. and they're coming here. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to stretch my imagination. There could even be a possibility that disease came, and some people have been infected, and because they're in a certain state, like the one you have described, 
some of those maybe it has even passed without your knowledge? Um, it's, that is a possibility, but it's very unlikely. Okay. Uh, uh, partly because by the uh, although the thing started in China and the Chinese were coming here, the Chinese government was quite responsible. And even with their embassy here, they, they did inform government here quite early. And they actually even um, set up systems to start immediately tracing anybody who was coming from China. They got screened from there. And within a few days of that announcement, a system had been set up here. So in, in terms of... Um, <coughs> Of, um, of, of, of outcomes. Yes, some people remain asymptomatic. That is, they will not sure. have any symptoms. Then others may have mild disease. And uh, what we have learned, because this is a brand new disease, it's three, less than three months old. We are still learning a lot of things about it. But in the countries where it is, uh, is present, it is mostly the elderly, who are exper experiencing the most severe disease. And uh, it is mostly those who have additional problems. But that does not mean even the young or young children or even the uh, young adults are not experiencing. Actually, there, there are some. And um, as, as health workers, we have lost several uh, health workers. For example, partly it will also depend on the infective dose. So if a person who gets exposed to maybe one virus, the virus will take a long time before it Multiply. multiplies into millions. Rather than a health worker who is close to a patient, then suddenly gets a large dose. That person is more likely to progress uh, quickly. And that may be one of the reasons, actually, particularly for us as health workers, uh, more people are being affected. Dr. Idro, Dr. Kabanda, and Mr. Ramadan Gobi, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, i open the lines. You're going to see the numbers on your screen. Uh, you can pick your phone and call us and tell us what you think or even give us your experience from where you are. We'll be right back. We'll be discussing the impact of COVID-19 in Uganda. I want, <coughs> excuse me, I want to know, for example, we are using sanitizers, washing hands. By the way, I've used a lot of sanitizers in the last three days than I have ever used in the last 40 years. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> but now I'm told that there's even fake sanitizer so I'm, I'm worried I'm, it could be, be I was maybe I was busy using wrong ones so how do we get how, how are you handling something like that because you, 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 your docket is is information yes we have uh, we have received a number of reports from from the public and also seen a number of uh, cases where some some smart uh, some smart Ugandans have actually attempted so an opportunity in the problem so an opportunity in the problem to do something actually like attempted to to, to even uh, go an extent of laboring a particular a particular brand name brand name which is actually not in the case and uh, actually some of them have been arrested today actually the PS was involved uh, in, a, in a, that kind of scenario and some of them have been arrested today for but selling fake for sanitizer. selling fake sanitizers and also for using brand names of yeah. institutions but our guidance to the public is that um, we, we, we are we are requesting the public to be cautious and also to make sure that they only get products from renowned uh, uh, areas like supermarkets or uh, from pharmacies, if they possible. Expensive, they so they should cheap. they should desist from getting products from hawkers for this for the sanitizers, and also from the streets. But okay, one would say that um, uh, those from the supermarkets are a little bit expensive, but what is the essence of going with something that is cheaper but which is not effective? Which can so end up killing you. Which, yes. Cause, cause your death. Uh, okay, apart from sanitizers, there should be other ways. I mean, this is a moment when you could tell Ugandans, because I'm told effective washing with, your, with soap and water is just as good. Yes, we, we have also had a lot of social media criticism from people because there is that provision of saying that if you cannot be able to, to, to provide um, hand washing facilities, actually we are, we are emphasizing running water with soap. Because you remember those days in rural communities, you have you have uh, stagnant water. You are able to, to wash your hands and you give your brother or mm -hmm. your sister the same person the wash. Same. Yes, in the same in the same stuff, which is not actually right. So we are emphasizing that you should be able to have access to running water with soap. So a number of people are saying that people actually cannot be able to afford uh, hand sanitizers, and there's the other the other cheaper and uh, most common option, which we are encouraging the public actually to adopt too. But for people like Patrick, who are in, a, in, a, in such kind of settings, 
then it may be difficult for you, the even those class. who are traveling, for example, it may be difficult for them so to when have such home, kind of So when you're at home, you can actually yes. keep washing your hands? Yes. So uh, how often should somebody wash their hands? No, we are saying that if possible, do it as much more often as, you, as, as possible, depending on how busy, how busy you are. Your, the hands are. Yes. I, I, I don't remember if you also read something to do with um, uh, exchange of money yes. and, uh, and, uh, and issues, raise, uh, issues raised from the public <coughs> and how contagious it may be. And uh, the guidance from, from the economists that it would, it would have been better even for our people now to adopt the e-cash kind of uh, uh, payments and acceptance. If you have a supermarket or if you have a shop, you have something, it's either better for you to be able to open up something that will be able not to expose you to be at risk of, of getting Because the money can be, the, can, can be a carrier of, of, yes. of, the, of even, the virus. Even beyond COVID, even beyond COVID, most of our, 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 most of the preventable diseases actually are hygiene related. So it's better for us that now that actually I talked about it, now this should be a spark for us to be able to move from uh, a wrong uh, position, be able to move in the right direction. Okay, uh, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, how should uh, Honorable Kasaija and Keith Mohakanizi, who are running the economy, be intervening? First, they, sh they, they should make sure that businesses don't lay off people as a result of this. But we need to, to support it at macro level. You know, whatever happens in the economy at micro levels can be contained at the macro the first step is to share risks with the banks. The banks are the lifeline now which are going to support this economy in this period. But I, I, I haven't seen any government announcement that uh, they are going to engage the banks and see how, for example, number one, to restructure the loans which businesses are running right now in such a way that uh, the businesses are able to have some lifeline for some time, say three to six months, and then they pay later, with the government coming in to share this risk with the banks. Secondly, the, there is need to also put down the tax expectations by URA. They need to give some deferrals now to businesses, it's not to pay tax right now. Um, as they go through this period, and then they pay later when they have, the businesses have normalized. The same with the even other statutory requirements like NSSF and so on. This is what other countries are doing. But also we need to go in and directly find ways of supporting the economy. The challenge we are having right now, I don't think the government of Uganda has money. I really don't think so. Because I, um, recently they went to parliament to borrow money to finance the budget because there was a challenge with the cash flow. So we are asking the government to protect cash flows of private sector, but we are not very sure whether the government is cash flow itself is okay. But even if it's not okay, Government can print money. This but is a period. Cause inflation. No, Please. let me tell you, we can. Uh, I, I strongly believe, you, and this is why we always say you need to have some fiscal space, some buffer which you can use. Bank of Uganda has done a commendable job in the recent past of keeping inflation at below five percent. Our target inflation is five. I know inflation might rise a bit by a percentage or so points. We could do as well tolerate in a, some little bit of inflation now as we support this economy not to go under. And these businesses which are uh, being closed down or they are suffering cash flow challenges or they are unable to get their supplies, we need to find a way of supporting them. And uh, to me, we need to support them so that they don't lay off workers. Because if Ugandans get laid off, that, and yet they, they, some of them might get sick as well, that, that, that would be catastrophic. Are, are we not likely, I'm, I'm stretching my imagination, to f for those who are telecoms who are now into money, money business, mm. to start something like credit creation? 
You know, uh, good you have talked about telecos. Actually, they have also a big role to play in this economy right now. But uh, again, the state had constrained them, taxing mobile money, taxing internet, this OTT, and so on. These are now things which government needs to relax a bit and ensure that these telecos can be also work. And they need to be linked up with the banks such that that process you are talking about of uh, moving around the money and create some money can happen. Because right now, what is happening? People are in a wait and see mode. People are I'm, I'm imagining somebody in telco can just go to the computer and then uh, right now and, and, and put seven million shillings on your on on, on your account and and uh, that um, money has to have uh, also a base. But, but in the yeah, bank. but in most because cases, because virtual money yes has a mirror image. Let me let me ask you. Well, real money in, in the bank. It, yes, but real money in the in the bank as real hard cash yep. is not equivalent the virtual money that you have? I um, mean, I don't have evidence to that effect. What I know is that... <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, I don't know um, where you are getting that. You are... Well, we get to maybe you are a better <laughs> investigator. You, you are an economist. Maybe you can know that better. But let me open the lines so that we can get some views from Ugandans and get to know what you, you are thinking or what you have seen or what you have heard. Please tell us your name and where you are from and make it precise and concise so that we get more views from different parts. So, I'm taking the first call of line. Hello. Hello. Good evening, ma'am. Yes, good evening. What's your name and where are you calling from and what's the issue? Yeah, this is Vera, the student of uh, UMI. Okay, student of UMI. Yes. Okay, go right ahead. Um, I don't know the magnitude of sensation that is going on in the public, but uh, I haven't seen what is appropriate for the local community. Mm -hmm. I interacted with somebody who came from the side of Massachusetts again, and actually got to understand the reality mm -hmm. of corona here in Kampala. So it means that if Masaka is so close to Kampala, what about the person in Kampala? So I would think that the messages regarding the spread of coronavirus should have been Localized in the language that people can understand. Oh. In, in the public places, in the market. And then the other concern is what, what is the, the ministry telling people about the commodities that they are buying in the market? How can people sanitize the food that they are buying? Those are the measures that are pertinent now to help the people to know how to deal with the situation. All right. The other thing that has been said is uh, about uh, sharing toilets and uh, facilities within your home. That would also be pertinent information for families to know how to regulate themselves within the family. All right. Thank you very much. I must, must say you've asked very important questions. And the good thing that we have somebody in charge of that particular docket in the Ministry of Health right here, a commissioner. Um, so let me try to take maybe two more. Sorry about that. We seem to have uh, lost the connection to that caller. Let me try to take another call online. Hello. 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 Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Edwin. Edwin? I'm calling from uh, Awanda. All right. Go right ahead, sir. Yes. Thank you for the talk. And uh, I would like to address the comment you, you asked. You, Sorry. you asked why uh, COVID is being given so much attention, yet diseases which have been veteran have been ignored. Okay. I, uh, did you get that question? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you very much. Let me uh, try to take maybe the last one, and then we shall have Dr. Kavanda respond. Hello. Hello. Good evening. I have a call online. Hello. I think I'm, I'm having trouble now with the technology. I'm just going to try one more. Hello? Good, good evening. What's your name and where are you calling from? Um, Ivan calling from Busia. Ivan in Busia? Yes, sir. You're on air. Go right ahead, Busia. Now, for me, I'm a bit worried because I'm calling from uh, a border center. Okay. 
Now we are worried we are because we are not seeing any mechanism on the border post. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for us, for you, you're saying you're in Busia at the border with Uganda and Kenya and you don't see uh, the health teams doing what they're expected to do in trying to, uh, you know, check the people coming in. All right. Uh, I think let me close the line so that uh, if you can quickly, uh, Dr. Kabanda, go through some of these and then we make your concluding remarks. Okay, they have uh, asked quite a number of questions. Uh, one of them is in, uh, in line with localizing messages. And um, I would say that that is entirely not true. On, uh, over, over, over the weekend, I was in a quite rural area. And people actually were detached from shaking hands. And that's an indication that actually people are aware about, about COVID-19. But uh, in line with localizing messages, which you are giving out to, to, to our communities, we have actually done this. And uh, working with our partners, UNICEF and WHO, we actually printing, uh, starting from yesterday, we actually printed a number of uh, a number of materials, and we have also gone ahead to share a number of uh, uh, health promotion messages with the uh, media institutions in localized languages. Okay. So that has been done. And uh, the other area of uh, sharing toilets and uh, toilet facilities, we we gave guidance in our in our guidelines and we are recommending that at, at, at maximum one toilet should be used by maximum 20 people and we have given guidance that uh, they should be disinfected. They should be cleaned and disinfected all the time because that's the only sure way that can be sure that uh, in any case if one has a particular, particular even beyond COVID, that's the only sustainable way. Then um, uh, one raised something to do with the community, uh, commodities being bought and these other gadgets, we, we, we have also given gu guidance that if you are in touch with the, some gadgets, including, say, your phones or anything, it's better for you to disinfect them because you don't know at what point in time they were actually contaminated. So for, 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 for some of the products, actually, which you think, uh, some of the items which you think that uh, you're always in close contact with them, it's better to take the precautionary measures. Um, someone raised something which you had actually raised also that... Uh, People are, we, we had ignored other diseases, but for COVID, it is, I think some, some of my colleagues here raised it, and uh, I remember Richard uh, responded to it. But you know, for COVID, is a special case that it is a scare to everybody. Malaria is unique, for example. Some countries don't even have actually, they don't know it. They, they don't know it. So they get surprised when they come to, to Uganda or other, other, other mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan African countries. And, and so, so, so this is a unique disease. Which that's why uh, it, it, has take, it has taken a global global attention, and and as the, as the country, we should really be able to also. Take it appears it all viral diseases can spread across yes. the globe. Yes, as if they don't have a border. And uh, and uh, <laughs> if, if if for example you look at um, if you look at the attention given, for example, to HIV, global am among other other communicable diseases, is also unique, because globally people know that they can actually easily get it. So the funding for HIV prevention in the country is actually unique compared to TB. So, but it takes us back to what I, what, what I talked about, that if you look at even these other diseases, which people think that they actually neglected, most of other communicable diseases and the non-communicable diseases, the biggest percentage is, is in line with the, our behaviors and what we need to do. So this is a spark. COVID is a spark for us to be able to wake up and know that we have a duty to, to play okay. as the health sector, but also as other stakeholders. And what is your parting shot? Concluding remark. Um, I'm, I'm requesting the public to, to, to take a COVID as a serious issue and also be able to, to move in the right direction following the guidance provided by the Minister of Health and also taking into account what uh, the head of state uh, provided for us yesterday. Dr. Richard. Um, as health workers, um, we are dedicated to providing health care to, to all Ugandans. And um, this is one of these scenarios. And uh, currently, we are trying to prepare, even if this is a new disease, to come up with guidelines of how we can identify, screen, test, isolate, and treat even the severe cases. Mm -hmm. And um, we, ask, uh, we invite the public. Of course, sometimes as health workers also, we may experience, because this is completely a unique thing that uh, is a complete, uh, very stressful uh, period for health workers. They are working for long, long periods, and many of them may also have to be, as, especially those who may work 
in the units of the isolation unit. Right. They may not be able to go back to your uh, families. <coughs> Let's support all our health workers. They are they indeed putting in quite a lot to to try to prevent uh, this disease from reaching here, but to care also for the Thank you very patients. much, Dr. Richard Idro. Uh, by the way, is this Richard related to Philip? No. Okay. <laughs> we say a name. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ramadan Gobi. Yes, thank you. Um, I, what I would want to, to tell Ugandans is, is that, as the doctors have told us, COVID is a, is a reality. Much as it has not hit us, um, it is directly, it is on the way. But we shouldn't panic to stop our lives and stop the economy from functioning. Because at the end of the day, even poverty kills. And it kills, by the way, quite more numbers. Although you don't get to know that they have died of poverty. They don't announce that somebody died disease. of poverty. But if you don't have you money... people dying of hunger right now. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't get and money... the only medicine is food. You will not get it. If you don't make money, you will not be able to even treat yourself when you get sick. So we need to see people continuing to work, but uh, being very careful with their lives. They have already given us guidelines. Follow them as you, you work and ensure that you keep alive. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, who is a lecturer at Makere University Business School. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard Idro, who is the president of Uganda Medical Association. And we thank you very much, Dr. Richard Kabanda, uh, Commissioner, Health Promotions, Minister of Health. And uh, also earlier we had Dr. Diana Twin, who is the PS uh, Minister of Health. We had her online. And all of you have been a part of this uh, conversation. We, we appreciate your insights on the matter. And also we thank you for your great company. I know the COVID is here, but Ugandans who have been in this kind of thing before, we have been hit by Ebola. We had to survive. We've been hit by Mabag. We had to survive. We've had gone through tumultuous times, and Ugandans have survived. And I think if we pull together and listen to the experts and listen to the leadership and maybe do the social distancing and keep hope alive, we may, we may stay safe. And stay safe, keep hope alive. Good night, and God bless Uganda.